Okay, I'm going to start recording now, and let's go around. And, uh, and Joyce, you're in my upper left, so why don't you tell us, start off with uh, how are you doing and how was your week and any prayer concerns, any of that. Good morning, Travis and Betty. Um, no, my week was good. Um, everyone is good in the family, um, so no, no concerns. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we're doing okay. We, uh, I, I do. When we finish every, going around with everybody, we want to talk about Linda Gelzer's, um, the uh, her mom's funeral today, and the uh, we'll we'll get you caught up on that one. But Jerry, let's go to you next. Okay. Um, I have a celebration. Um, everything went wonderfully. Um, very successful. This was the Northeast police drive. Um, there were four of us from New Song with myself, Patty Baker and Sarah Stafford that went on Thursday to put the boxes together. And um, of course, um, Officer Smith had everything extremely well organized when we got there. We did cafeteria style and we loaded 300 boxes in less Wonderful. So it was, it was very successful. That's so awesome. Again. Yes. That's awesome. Diana, you're next on our screen here. How are you doing? Muted. I'm doing, I'm doing well. Um, prayer requests, you know, when I ran into Doug this morning, we haven't really seen much of this because we haven't been at church, obviously, and we see it a little bit in the emails, but I think just prayer for Doug and Heather and Darren as they transition. Yes. Gary may have mentioned this the other week too. Um, just as they transition into their new roles, because uh, as Doug said, Mark was kind of a human Velcro, like he took on things that just kind of stuck to him. So, you know, the list of things that Mark did that I think none of us were probably aware of is now having to be redistributed to everybody, you know, who's, who's assuming part of his role. So just prayer for them as they um, try to navigate all that and, uh, yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. Thank you. Vicki, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. It's been great. I came down to see him yesterday, and my son and I got to visit a long time, and my daughter-in-law, so we just, you know, I'm good. Uh, yeah. My niece, Tony, uh, talks to her doctor tomorrow. He, he look at all of her images that she had done a week or so ago, so uh Hopefully he'll have a plan for her, or maybe he doesn't want her to start to know or anything with her uh, um, lymphoma. Good, well, good. But and and Vicky, you know you're you're closing us in prayer today on this one. Yeah. Okay. All right, Carrie okay. How are, and Carrie Donaldson, how are you doing? Doing well. Going stir crazy. I you, I had been handling it quite well, but this past week has been hard. You know but I don't dare get out, I, even with a mask or anything, because I do have a underlying a lung condition that's not gonna kill me, but it will make me susceptible to something like the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. My pulmonologist said, don't do it. And I said, I don't. Okay, well, good for you, good for you. Brian, how about you? Well, uh, I got some not good news last week. I had a, another MRI done on my back, because it was yeah. killing me. And um, the L5 S1 disc that I've been dealing with for three and a half years appears to be fine, but I have four new ones that have herniated. Uh, and one of them, L4 L5, is particularly bad. I'm sitting here with an ice pack on right now. Oh, man. Um, so I'm going to go see a doctor on um, Tuesday, uh, see what he recommends. So you have five discs at one time that are herniated? Four. Four? The, fi the fifth one, they apparently they heal on their own if you wait long enough. And that, yeah. first, one, that first one healed on its own. But uh, yeah, four new ones. Boy, so, one's too much to take. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. Go get well, some PT, Brian. It'll at least help. You got to find you, somebody good to help you. Oh, the PT? Yep. I've got a guy. I've got uh, a I'll program. I'll email you, and he he's terrific. So, uh, if you, if you're looking for someone, okay, awesome, awesome. Kay and Jim, how are you doing? We're doing well. 
every everybody's well. Wonderful. That's wonderful. We're, we're, just, we're just here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, I'm glad you are. I'm glad you are. Aaron, you're next on our screen. How are you and Leanna doing and your and your daughter? We're good. Uh, Henley is loving being here with uh, grandparents and great grandparents and and all those people around her. Um, we are going back tomorrow, and we're a little anxious about getting back on an airplane. Um, but other than that, we're doing pretty good. Yeah. Well, good. It's good to see you, Bonnie. How about you and Robert? We're doing good. Uh, doing fine. We did get out of town for a couple of days and went to the state park, and that was nice. We, yeah, we could isolate in our trailer, and uh, it's uh, it, uh, and uh, that's it. How do you like your new trailer, Bonnie? Uh, we liked it. It was good. It's smaller, so we're having to learn to carry less. <laughs> but I'm, that's probably good because I probably take too much stuff. I'm always take it just in case. Might need it just in case. But, uh, now, how about Jeff? He's uh, he's still doing okay. He, uh, you know, they just haven't we just can't go visit him because uh, mm -hmm. of dealing. He's in the hospital around uh, COVID people, with patients and coworkers. So uh, I'm, I'm sad about that, but he's doing okay and he's healthy at this point. And, good, very good. Carolyn, how are you doing? How's, how is Colorado? Okay. It's fun, we get a lot of rain, you all don't. We get a lot of coolness, you all don't. So <laughs> I've already been there, done that. I did want to say I'm, uh, I, I really appreciate this particular Zoom uh, get together because it seems like all of y'all are very experienced and you know exactly what to do and how to do it. And I'm getting on other Zoom meetings and, mm -hmm. and uh, it takes a while for people to catch on. So well, way this, ahead of well, let me tell you, today is a record. This is our first three time zone Zoom for Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We have one Eastern, one one Mountain, and the rest of it Central. So yes, <laughs> that's the good thing about it. Yeah. Yes, that is good. And Faye, how are you and Mark doing? Oh, uh, we're good. Nothing special or you know different. It's all the same. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, is your mom okay? Yeah, she's with me today. So good. We'll Wonderful, wonderful. Travis and Patty, how are you doing? We're mostly intact. We, uh, we're, we're hurting through the loss of our friend Lou. Wednesday morning, we lost him. And, uh, but we, we went to see his wife and sons who were in, both in town mm. on Friday. We took them some food that Patty uh, fixed for them. And they're doing as well as you could, as you could expect in a time like this. They had smiles on their faces. And, uh, you know, they were working through it. And they, they, they never found out what happened to him, how he ended up in the hospital or? So far, we don't know. Um, so far, we're not sure what happened. Uh, that, that's got to be the worst part. I don't know if there'll be a medical exam. Uh, I, I, you know, it, it's a little too soon to, to ask what yes. uh, Jean and her sons know. Um, but, uh, Maybe at some point we'll know more. I, I don't know that we ever will, though. Yes, I'm just so sorry. That's a terrible thing for just to have. They just lost him for 12 hours and found him in a hospital, right? Exactly. And and he's just he was such a wonderful guy. I mm. hate, I'm so sorry for his family. They never really got to say goodbye to him, then, did they? Oh, oh look at him, hi, <laughs> baby. You, hi there. <laughs> 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 Hello. Yes. Tracy, how are you? Oh, that's a good wave. <laughs> that's a great wave. Tracy, how are you doing? Are you at your mom's? Uh, greetings from beautiful Mineral Wells, Texas. So, yep. yes, I am. And uh, I did go in this week for cataract surgery evaluation. So, uh, that took a couple of hours. And there's some options there from, you know, basic up to deluxe. So, but... Uh, Looking forward to making that happen. Maybe get rid of the contacts and the glasses for a while. Yes. Well, keep us posted on uh, that. Dennis, um, <clears throat> Linda Gessler, any word on 
Yeah, we'll, um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do that at the very last. We'll we'll finish okay. up on some of that. Diana and Vicky have been been working on that a lot, and uh, we'll do that. But Sandra, let's go to you. Let's you can talk. Plus, how are you doing, Sandra? I'm doing very well, and I wanted to say something to Aaron because I miss seeing Henley every Wednesday. I miss you too, Aaron, but I, I enjoyed watching Henley grow and I haven't seen a picture of her. So I need a picture, Aaron, on the, send you one. On the video, okay. Yes, that's great. And Don and Barbara, we hope you, you're, you're doing well. Let's, let's turn to Linda Gelser's mom's funeral, Carolyn Gelser's funeral. Um, Diana checked with her, and then she she they, she was gonna uh, she has a a mission I mean a, a memorial fund that we might want to contribute to as a class. And her mother was the organist at First Baptist El Campo for forty years, mm -hmm. um, and so we would like to give a, a memorial in in the class's name. We also sent flowers um, because none of us were going to be there. I would have loved to have been there. It would have been a ten hour round trip. Um, but the, what, what we discussed, I think Diane and Vicki and Laura and I discussed is that we might be also be taking a place of someone who knew her, you know, that, you know, we didn't know what the, how, how, how big the church would be or whatever. So we're, we're going to, they're, they're going to live stream the service at three 30 this afternoon. And Diane is going to send the link out this afternoon for that. Uh, it's going to be on the church's, it's on First Baptist Church's website, but she'll have the link to get you to their video streaming page. There are two things on the video page. One is audio at the top, and then at the bottom is a YouTube link. That's where it's supposed to be. So we're doing that. Now, if you would like to, let's talk about this just a little bit. If we can do individual gifts, or we can kind of lump all our gifts together and make one gift for the class, which is kind of the way I'm leaning. And if you guys are for that, I would like for us to send our um, send. I think we just mail a check to Vicky. Vicky's gonna Vicky's gonna collect all those. So if you would like to donate to that, do that, and um, we'll we'll take care of the, so the the we'll we'll split up the flower cost as well and, and do a donation for her in her honor to First Baptist. Is that does that sound okay, class? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great, Dennis. Okay, yeah. and so. What Diana, when you see the email today from Diana, uh, it will have the recap of, of the lesson and it will have this recording and uh, it will have all the prayer requests that are up to date from today. When you see that, you'll also see the link to that um, service that is at 3.30 um, and, it's, it'll, and it's on the video streaming uh, pay, ta page of the that, of First Baptist El Campo. So you'll see that. So then it will also have, we'll also have Vicki's um, address to mail the checks to. Um, that you that you feel comfortable doing that. Uh, let's try to get them all in by August fifth. Um, so we'll give ourselves a little bit of time to do that. And there are people who aren't on this who might want to contribute as well. So we'll we'll send that information when Diana sends that email out. It'll, it'll we'll have that on there. So at any rate, could I add something? Yes. May I add something? Yes. Uh, I was thinking if they if you write your check to me, then I will send one check. Okay, okay, from the group. Okay? okay, that just works better. Okay, and your Vicky, your address is thirty-five twenty-one Ainsworth. Right. And okay. Diana will be sending that address to... out. She'll be sending that address out on the email today as well. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so any rate, big picture wise, the flowers we sent, I thought they were going to go first to the gravesite and then to the church. The florist turns out new Carolyn Gelzer. Carolyn used to buy flowers from this florist. I mean, it's a small town, it's 11,000 people. They have two They have two floral shops. And I asked Carolyn, what is your mom's favorite color? There was this, Linda, sorry. I, and, and there's this long delay and she was talking to her siblings, her brother and sister. And she said, they don't have a favorite color. She said, she just likes bright colors and the brightest colors you can get. So that's what we ordered. I told that to the florist. She said, yes, that's Carolyn. And she also is the one who's doing the flowers for the casket as well. So um, she felt honored to be able to do that for, for Carolyn. So we were lucky. So, Dan, yes. Can we send you some money for those flowers then? That, that would be fine. That would be fine. And uh, will anything that's extra that goes on that, we're going to put into the memorial. But that sounds fine. Yes. 
And so at any rate, the, the end of the story is, so the florist said they, those flowers, if we took them out to the grave site with the wind and stuff that's going on with the hurricane and the rains, they, they said they'd get beat up. So they're going straight to the church. So they'll be there for the service. And then the funeral home will take the, it's a stand. It's a, it's a freestanding stand of flowers with, with a, with, from foundations of faith. Um, and then they will take that out to the grave site after the, after the uh, celebration of life service. So that's, that's all I know on, on Linda's uh, mom's funeral. Diana, or do you have anything else to add on that one? You talked to Linda more than I did. Okay. She and I just texted back and forth. So you, I think you covered about all of it. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I think we're pretty much done, covered everybody. Um, I will say she was very appreciative of, of all of our support. She was extremely grateful for everybody's kindness and for your prayers. So. Well, and what we need to do, and I think Vicki brought this up the other day, we're going to need to take care. Linda is surrounded by family right now. When she gets back to Dallas, she's going to be by herself. So mm -hmm. we're going to need to be conscious of that and reach out to her every chance we get. On that. Her sister and uh, her sister does live in Carrollton. So oh, she okay. does have at least one person close by. Okay. 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 And she now has, she, Carol, uh, Linda now has her sister and brother-in-law watching the, um, some of the Wilshire services online zooming. It's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool. Okay. Aaron, if you'll take it to about 9.45, 9.50, or whenever you finish, if you want us to read, we'll do that. I'm going to mute everybody and then unmute you. And it's all yours, Aaron. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Today, we are talking about the book of Isaiah, um, which is, on its own, probably the most um, complex book of the Hebrew Bible. Not in terms of content, it's relatively straightforward. Um, straighten up or God is going to smite you and then God will restore you afterwards. Um, that, the message is fairly straightforward. Um, but in terms of the way that the book came to be, we could spend you know, hours and hours together talking about um, compositional theories and, and all of that. So we're not going to do that because we don't have hours and hours. But I'll just give you briefly kind of an overview of the two major theories and then we'll actually talk about the book itself. So obviously the first major theory is that this book was written by the prophet Isaiah, um, probably over a span of two different distinct time periods because if you've ever read through the book completely in one sitting, uh, not only are you a hero because it's 66 chapters of uh, pretty dense poetry, um, but you'll also notice that chapters 1 through 39 have hang together fairly well and then chapters 40 through 66 feel a little bit different um, 1 through 39 is a little bit more uh, justice and righteousness and, and do right or god is going to you know come smack you down and then 40 through 66 is a little bit more kind of tender and god is going to restore you um, and so the the argument goes that if this book was written by isaiah the first half was written uh, early on in his prophetic career, and then the second half was written much later, um, probably sometime uh, all around the year 700 or so after Judah had experienced um, some pretty significant military defeats, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Uh, the other school of thought is that the prophet Isaiah wrote part of the book, probably chapters 1 through 39, and then there was a, a larger kind of school of Isaiah's disciples and, and kind of, um, you know, his kind of intellectual um, tradition that wrote chapters uh, 40 through 66 at a later time period, perhaps even a significantly later time period, um, because there are some references, um, especially in chapters 55 through 66, to historical events that Isaiah could only have known about um, supernaturally. And he may have, you know, I don't want to discount the idea that um, God could have given Isaiah foreknowledge of particular events. Um, but I also know that that type of sort of future telling is not the main mode of prophetic speech in the Hebrew Bible. Um, most prophets are dealing in the present and they're offering a word to people in the here and now. And so in chapter um, 
oh, I can't remember the exact chapter off the top of my head, but in that span of 55 through 66, uh, the book talks about uh, King Cyrus of the Persians, who's eventually going to set, his, or set Judah free and return them to their promised land. Well, Cyrus doesn't come along until the 570s, uh, 560s. Isaiah is probably dead around the year 700. So um, again, it's a choice between was this a prophet with supernatural foreknowledge or was this book uh, edited at a later time period by people who stood in the same tradition as the prophet who applied his message of judgment and restoration to their own time and place, which by the way is a pretty you know, time-honored uh, Jewish way of reading scripture. We'll see that when we talk a little bit about how Jesus uses the book of Isaiah. So those are the two kind of major um, thoughts. Either this was written by, entirely by the prophet over two different periods, or part of it was written by Isaiah, and parts of it were written by people in the same sort of stream of thought as Isaiah. But the reality is that the whole book is in our Bible, and it's presented to us as one book. And there is a sort of um, unity of theme, a sort of compositional unity, uh, and also the fact that, you know, it's it's all together in the book. And so we have to, regardless of how we believe it came to be, we have to deal with the book as a whole because the whole book is, is in our sacred canon. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about the book uh, and about really, I wanna talk a little bit more about the context of the book uh, before we get into the actual uh, meat of the text itself. So, um, and by the way, if anybody has questions at any point, I don't know how Dennis, you can get Dennis's attention, you know, wave your hands or hold up a sign or something, but, um, you know, jump in. So as far as Isaiah himself, we don't know a lot about the prophet. Um, chapter one, verse one tells us chronologically when his career occurs, because he mentions that he prophesied during the reign of four different Judean kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Uh, who collectively ruled for over 60 years, which means that Isaiah lived a very long life, a kind of unusually long life. Um, probably didn't start prophesying until the end of King Uzziah's reign, because one of the very first things we learn about um, Isaiah is that he is called to be a prophet in the year that King Uzziah died. Um, so his prophetic career spans roughly 50 years. Um, he's active as a prophet from about 750 to about 700 BCE. That's kind of his, his general time period. Uh, we also know, by the way, that some other Hebrew prophets were active around the same time. Um, Hosea and Micah both wrote their books and gave their prophecies during the same time as Isaiah. And the prophet Amos was active just a little bit before um, Isaiah. So it's entirely possible that these four prophets uh, we're all kind of aware of each other and knew what the other was doing because um, they all have very similar themes of having to do with justice and righteousness and the importance of justice and righteousness to the continuation of the, the Jewish people. Um, let's see, we know a few details about his personal life. We know that he was from Jerusalem and that he lived there all of his life and he has a very special um, connection and concern for Jerusalem, both as his home and as the seat of the Davidic kings. Um, a big part of Isaiah's uh, prophecy is the kind of um, attention of the ruler to justice and righteousness on a national level. And a big part of what we'll see in the end of the book is about the restoration of an ideal king, whether that's uh, the Messiah or a human king, we can, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But he has a particular concern for Jerusalem. Uh, we know that he is the son of a man named Amos, Amos with a Z, uh, but we don't know from the Bible who Amos is. There is a rabbinic tradition that Amos was the brother of King Amaziah of Judah, who was the father of Uzziah, which would make uh, Isaiah a part of the royal household. And we do see uh, throughout the book that Isaiah has pretty um, far-reaching access to the royal court. Um, he's summoned by kings all the time. He also feels like he has the power to confront kings and to confront other members of the royal court. Um, there are other prophets and other religious officials that Isaiah gets in all kinds of fights with throughout the course of this book. Um, there are also 
not afraid to um, sort of put Isaiah in his place from their perspective when they need to. Um, so that suggests to a lot of people that Isaiah, at the very least, um, is very comfortable in the royal court. Um, and gives a lot of credence to this idea that maybe he's a member of the royal family, but that's something that we don't know for sure. Uh, he was married or um, to a woman that is only identified by the title of the prophetess. That's in chapter 8, verse 3. And it's unclear from the context whether that means she is the wife of the prophet or whether she was a female prophet in her own right. Uh, there's no really no good way to, to know exactly what he means by that. And they have at least two children. Um, with really great names. There's Shir Jashub, which in Hebrew means a remnant will return. And then this one, this one is my favorite, uh, his younger son, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, uh, which in Hebrew basically means uh, plunder quickly, uh, spoil speedily, something like that. Uh, and they both have symbolic names, which was uh, unfortunately true for the children of prophets fairly often. Um, a remnant will return, uh, Shir Jashub is obviously a reference to you know, the Israelites or the Judeans coming back from the impending exile that they're going to experience. And then Maher Shalal Hashbaz, the idea of plundering quickly uh, is sort of um, almost like a, a symbol of, of mercy. You're going to be destroyed, but it's going to happen swiftly, um, which is kind of an ironic form of mercy, but it is kind of, you know, when you, when you know you're going to be destroyed, the best thing you can hope for is a quick destruction. Uh, it's also possible so in chapter seven, there's the really famous segment about the young woman conceiving and bearing a child and calling him Emmanuel. Uh, there are some scholars who actually argue that the young woman in that passage is Isaiah's wife, and this Emmanuel child is also one of Isaiah's children. Uh, the problem is that the text is incredibly vague. Uh, the young woman who is identified in chapter seven is never given any other identification besides the young woman. Um, and so we don't know who she is. So he, she could be Isaiah's wife. The more common belief is that she is the wife of, of the king and that the child, the Emmanuel child, actually winds up being uh, Hezekiah, who becomes a, an important and righteous king at the end of uh, Isaiah's lifetime. And then obviously, and here's an example, by the way, of people taking a piece of prophetic literature and then applying it to their own context, that passage from Isaiah 7 becomes descriptive of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, right? Um, so it meant something in Isaiah's time and place. Um, it meant that somebody nearby was going to have a baby, and that baby was going to be a sign of God's favor. And then it also means something in another time and place, um, and perhaps even in a more true sense uh, when Jesus comes along. So there's just one example of the ways in which uh, there's this sort of deep connection across time and space in, in these prophetic texts. So that's about all we know about Isaiah himself. Um, it's not a whole lot to go on, but with all the prophetic literature, the point is not so much the personality and um, identity of the prophet as much as what the prophet has to say and the context within which we say it, within which they say it. And we know an awful lot about that context. So Isaiah lived in a really, really profoundly unstable geopolitical climate. Uh, you think that the climate that we live in now is, is unstable. Uh, Isaiah basically witnessed um, everything in Judah outside of Jerusalem destroyed over the course of his lifetime. Uh, he also witnessed uh, the 10 northern tribes of Israel being carried off into exile he basically sort of watched his world slowly shrink down to the confines of one city over the course of his life. And we'll talk about that just a little bit because it's important for you to understand just how unstable his, his whole life was. So by the time Isaiah shows up in the middle of the 8th century, which is around 750 BCE, um, Judah, which with its capital in Jerusalem, and Israel in the north, have been separate kingdoms for about 250 years, 200, 250 years. Uh, if you go all the way back to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, there's a revolt against Rehoboam and the 10 Northern tribes split off, form their own kingdom. And then Judah and Benjamin in the South remain their own uh, entity. 
And so we have Israel in the north. We sometimes call it Samaria because that's where its capital was. And it gets really confusing when you're talking, are you talking about Israel, the 10 tribes or Israel, all 12? So Samaria, Israel, Samaria in the north, and then Judah in the south. So once they separate, they actually become uh, rival kingdoms for the most part, um, for a lot of reasons. The biggest one being that Judah has the temple. And if you are an observant Israelite, uh, we can't quite speak of Jews yet, but if you observe Israelite religion, you're required to go to the temple several times a year to make sacrifices, uh, which means that you have to go to Jerusalem several times a year, spend several days in Jerusalem, uh, which means you have to spend money to buy food, you have to spend money to buy animals for sacrifice, you have to spend money um, for, for taxes, for transportation. Uh, there's a lot of economic activity that happens in Israel, or in Judah, excuse me, when you go to sacrifice. So Israel actually ultimately winds up building its own altar uh, way up on the, nor on the northern border in a city called Dan to try and prevent its citizens from going down to Judah and spending all their money while they're in Judah. Um, but they also, uh, obviously, both of them kind of lay claim to being, you know, the sort of true kingdom of the people of God. And so they clash with each other uh, militarily frequently. And the whole region is made up of kind of smaller kingdoms that are constantly vying for power. And often Israel will ally with one kingdom and Judah will ally with another kingdom and they'll find themselves at war. So they're, they're kind of, there's a lot of infighting between Israel and Judah. Um, not a lot of territory ultimately changes hands, but it's just, it's kind of a politically unstable reality. You never really know whether your immediate neighbor is going to be friendly or not. I mean, that's like, imagine if, you know, Canada was significantly more aggressive and you could never tell, you know, if you wanted to go to Ontario for a weekend, whether you're gonna be able to get back across the border. Um, it's just, it's an untenable situation. So on top of that, over in what is now Iraq, the Assyrian empire has been gaining strength for about 300 years to the point that they're one of the most powerful empires in the world at this point. And they start moving west uh, because that's what you do when you have an empire. You just start expanding in, in every direction you possibly can. Uh, and to the east of Iraq, it's a lot of desert. You don't necessarily want to deal with that. So you head west to the ocean because if you can get to the Mediterranean, you can get to the rest of the world. So Assyria starts kind of uh, putting pressure on, um, on Israel and on Judah and things are pretty challenging. So ultimately what winds up happening around, um, around 750 is that um, Damascus, what is now modern day Syria, uh, calls up Israel and they say, hey, these Assyrians are giving us a lot of trouble. What do you say we stage a little rebellion? And Israel says, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's go talk to Judah and see what Judah thinks and see if they can join our rebellion. Uh, and the king of Judah says, I don't think we want to do that, uh, which is a pretty smart thing to do. This is King Ahaz, by the way, in case you want to um, keep track of all of this. Um, and so Damascus and Israel actually go to war against Judah, trying to depose Judah uh, and replace King Ahaz with a more cooperative king. And this, uh, this is usually called the Syro-Ephraimite War. Syro for Damascus and Ephraim is also another name that we use for Israel sometimes. Um, and this is actually the context, by the way, of the Emmanuel story in Isaiah 7. King Ahaz comes to Isaiah and he says, I need a sign from God that if I do what to me seems like the, the righteous thing to do and not join this rebellion, God is going to grant me victory. And Isaiah makes the prophecy about the young woman bearing a child and calling his name Emmanuel. And that's a sign that God is with, uh, with Judah and that Judah will succeed. Well, if you keep reading Isaiah 7, we never get um, a story about what the war looked like. But we ultimately know that Israel and, Dam and Syria, Damascus, were unsuccessful in overthrowing Judah. So they go back to their respective corners and things kind of settle down for a little while, and Judah survives. Well, about a decade, two decades later, excuse me, <clears throat> in the year 722, 
Israel decides that they want to try and revolt again. Well, by 722, there's a new king of the Assyrian Empire. His name is Shalmaneser V, and he decides that he doesn't want to be as lenient as his predecessors. So when Israel revolts in 722, the Assyrians swoop in and they destroy the kingdom completely. The 10 northern tribes are carted away into exile. Um, other citizens of the Assyrian Empire are brought in to settle in what was Israel. Um, and those 10 tribes are basically, they never get restored. Um, they're often referred to as the 10 lost tribes because unlike Judah, they never get sort of sent back as a whole. Now they don't just disappear, obviously. They, um, there are pockets of, of Jewish um, population in Iraq and Iran and places like that. They kind of integrated into society, but they are, you know, their kingdom is so utterly destroyed that they never actually get to occupy that territory. So Isaiah is witnessing all of this, and then things get worse. Uh, in 705, Shalmaneser, um, I'm sorry, Shalmaneser dies before that, but then in 705, his successor, a man who's called Sargon II, he actually dies in battle, and it destabilizes the whole region, because when the emperor, emperor suddenly dies, that's never a good thing for an empire. And so Judah decides that it wants to revolt against the Assyrians now. Finally, the time is right. And so King Hezekiah, who is the last king that Isaiah works for, works with, decides that he's going to revolt against the new Assyrian king, who is a man named Sennacherib. That plan goes very badly. Um, basically, Sennacherib marches his army into Judah, and he destroys everything that he can get his hands on. He comes up to the walls of Jerusalem, and he lays siege on the city, and eventually Hezekiah uh, begs for God's help. Uh, he comes to Isaiah, and he says, I, I, there's nothing left for me to do. What? How? Help me. And so eventually God intervenes on the behalf of Judah. Uh, Sennacherib uh, basically um, loses the battle for reasons that are still uh, in dispute. He kind of claims because he wrote all this down, by the way. We actually have Sennacherib's version of the whole war. He basically claims that he got bored and went home. Um, if you read Isaiah and if you read Kings, um, God apparently uh, brought a plague upon the Assyrian uh, army, and that was enough to kind of demoralize them and send them home. But basically, um, the, whole, the whole of Isaiah's life is consumed by geopolitical instability, um, by kings who are either trying to decide whether they want to accept the control of a foreign power or whether they want to revolt against it, um, by territory changing hands, by cities being destroyed, um, and by you know just this, this tremendous lack of any sense of, um, you know, my day-to-day -day existence is going to be okay and is going to be well-preserved. Eventually, um, Assyria is defeated by the Babylonians. Uh, the Babylonians don't like uh, Judah even more than the Assyrians don't. And so about a century later in the year 586, uh, Babylon comes in and ultimately destroys all of Judah, carries them away into exile. Um, and this is when it seems like the, the latter half of Isaiah is written, words of comfort to those who are in exile um, and a promise that they will be restored, which is ultimately what happens. Um, about 70, 80 years later, um, the Babylonians are defeated by the Persians and the Persians say, you know, you guys can go home, rebuild your temple, we'll help you with all of that. Um, but that's kind of the, the context in which Isaiah lived and in which at least the, the bulk of this book was written. And it's important to know that because um, it changes the ways that we, that we read the book, right? If you um, kind of, if you were given Isaiah 61, uh, which is our primary kind of focus passage for today, just completely out of context, and you read the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
Um, in the context that I grew up in, that passage was always spiritualized, right? Um, God has come to set free those people who are in bondage to sin. God has come to bind up those people who have been brokenhearted. Um, I mean, that's obviously a little bit metaphorical even in, in the passage, but it was always about kind of spiritual liberation, about setting people free from spiritual bondage. But the people that Isaiah is talking to are in literal physical bondage. They have been carried away by another empire. Their lives are in danger on a daily basis. And so when Isaiah says to them, God's promise to you is that God is sending someone who will set you free. He is obviously talking about freedom from sin and freedom from oppressive spiritual forces. But the, that freedom cannot be disentangled from their literal freedom. Because if you are somebody who believes that God has promised you, you know, the ability to occupy a piece of land and to enjoy, you know, self-determination in that context. And then all of a sudden that self-determination is taken away. Well, it doesn't do any good for someone to tell you, well, you know, God is going to set your heart free. You say, no, God promised that my body would be free too. And so when Isaiah makes this prophecy, makes this declaration of someone who promises to set people free, he's talking about literal, actual, political, with a small p, nonpartisan, but political freedom that impacts real people's lives and human bodies. And so that, that's really important because otherwise we read this passage, or at least, you know, the way that I was taught to read it growing up, and we see, oh yeah, spiritual liberation. And again, spiritual liberation is incredibly important. Uh, I don't want to diminish the, that as a part of this equation or try and set up, you know, a conflict as though political liberation and spiritual liberation are, are in conflict with each other. They go together. When bodies are liberated, souls are liberated and vice versa. And if you have one without the other, you don't have the full impact of what God intends um, for God's people. And so that like I said, it shapes how we read Isaiah 61. This is not a kind of disembodied abstract message, but it is very um, concrete. It is very actual. Um, and it's also urgent. You know, Isaiah is talking to a people who literally have, you know, enemy soldiers on their doorsteps. And so when he makes this prophecy, he's not sort of saying, you know, someday off in the future, everything is going to be all right. He's saying God is acting now. God is intervening now. And in Isaiah's context, um, Hezekiah actually kind of becomes, um, in some ways, the fulfillment of Isaiah 61, because he's one of the few righteous kings of Judah. He does make some mistakes, uh, which, Jer or, I'm sorry, which Isaiah will absolutely hold him uh, accountable to, but he uh, reinstitutes uh, temple sacrifices. He does all kinds of, the, of good things to make sure that the nation is attending to, um, to the law and to what God wants for them. Um, and so in some ways, he kind of becomes this ideal king. And if you keep reading, um, the whole passage is actually, it, it's really striking um, because it has these images of justice and righteous and restoration and Isaiah talks about righteousness will be so kind of prevalent um, in their society that they will literally be called oaks of righteousness. And then you get this metaphor of return um, and the, it's not just that they get to come back and occupy their own land, but the people who tried to oppress them actually wind up being their servants. And then in the last kind of part of the poem, you get these images of um, the, the forming of an everlasting covenant. You know, you, um, there's, there's a kind of marriage consummation, images that have become a big part of our own Christian theology of what um, God's good end looks like actually come from, from this book of Isaiah. Uh, the idea of the consummation of all things being a marriage feast that's actually found right here in Isaiah 61. Uh, and then you get this metaphor, uh, this sort of plant metaphor that I really, really love uh, way down in, in verse 11. 
For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Um, which suggests to me and to a lot of other people that um, there's a kind of inevitability to all of this. And not in kind of a, a fatalistic way of like, oh, we can just sit back and wait for God to do what God is going to do. But it is in the nature of plants to grow, right? Plants want to grow. If you give plants the things that they need and to survive, they grow. And Isaiah seems to be saying that's a part of the quality of God's vision for this world too, that it is growing. Even when we don't see it, even when we can't attend to it, um, this vision of God's good creation um, that is going to be ruled by justice and righteousness is always unfolding in the same way that, that plants are always unfolding. So that's uh, Isaiah, a little bit of Isaiah's context and a little bit of why it's important to know that context. We have like three more minutes. And so I just want to briefly touch on um, the way that Jesus uses this passage, because this is one of the um, longest direct quotations that Jesus makes of the Old Testament. Uh, in Luke chapter four, Jesus um, basically goes back to Nazareth and he kind of preaches his very first sermon. Um, he's actually called upon to read from the scroll of Isaiah and then to comment on it, which is how synagogue services operated. And so he finds Isaiah 61 and he reads the first couple of verses out loud. And then he says, oh, by the way, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, basically saying, I am, I am the person. Because um, if you read Isaiah 61 in context, when, when it says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, it's a little unclear who that is. There's, it's, is it the prophet? Is it the king? Jesus is saying, I'm the one. I am me. Me means Jesus. Um, and I am the one who has come to set people free uh, to fulfill completely the words that the prophet spoke. So this is a little bit about of what we talked about earlier, right? The, the, the prophet's message absolutely means something in the prophet's own time. Um, otherwise, why say it? If nobody can understand it, if nobody can interpret it, if it doesn't offer a word of hope in your moment in history, write it down in a book, seal it up, chuck it in a bin, wait until it actually means something. Isaiah's words absolutely meant something to his own people. And then 750 years later, Isaiah's words mean something to Jesus um, and to Jesus's followers. And perhaps what they mean to Jesus and his followers is the ultimate fulfillment of what they meant to Isaiah, but it's still, there's a through line between them. You know, Jesus doesn't change the meaning of the prophecy. He intensifies it. He said, you guys were hoping for a, a human king, a perfect righteous human king. And, you know, they got a pretty good one. Hezekiah was a pretty good king, but Jesus is saying, now that I have come, now the Messiah, which by the way is, you know, when it says the Lord has anointed me, that's the word in Hebrew for Messiah. Jesus says, now that the Messiah has come, we will have a complete or a more full um, version of that. We will have exactly what God has always intended, not just a kind of um, human king who can die in battle, which is ultimately what happens to Hezekiah, by the way, um, but you will have a perfect king who will execute perfect justice and righteousness, not just for you, but for the whole world. And so you can, you see that thread um, that runs between the two. And then Jesus, you know, cranks the dial up to 11 and says, this is exactly what um, Isaiah intended. And I am going to now fulfill it in the most true way possible. And that's just a little bit. Uh, Christians obviously use Isaiah in all kinds of other ways, but that's kind of the primary way in which Jesus interacts with this text to say, you know, it was true like this, and now it's going to be even more true um, that I have come. And so that's just a little bit about the book of Isaiah, and it is exactly 1050, so I'm going to turn it back over. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it very much. Just before Vicki prays, I think we had Robert join us here. Robert, how are, I don't know if you can talk, but are you doing okay? Robert, are you okay? He's muted. Okay. Okay. Well, then, if no one else has anything else to say, Vicky, if you would, um, if you would lead us in prayer, I would appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, and I hope you have a great week. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Pray with me, please. Our most gracious, heavenly Father and loving God, we just.
praise you today because you are holy. Um, I just pray that uh, you would help us to be more like Jesus every day in our everyday lives, doing for others and, and being an example to those around us when we have people around us. It seems to be rare right now. We just thank you for our many blessings because we know as a, as a people in this Zoom in particular, we're very blessed and we, we're making our way and we're surviving well. Just help us to um, not be anxious about this virus, but be cautious. Help us to be careful, help us to be safe, and help us just to continue to pray for each other. <clears throat> and take away our anxiety of uh, just not knowing what to do with our time. So I know some people have really, that I've talked to in the last week or two, really struggling. So I just pray that you will be with each of us during this time of confinement. Lord, today we have a lot of requests, a, a lot of needs within our group. Um, Linda will and her family experiencing the service for her mom today at 3.30. I just pray that you will wrap your arms around them and, and help them to really feel your presence, your comfort, your peace, your assurance, your warmth, your love today. We thank you for Jim Wade's recovery I and mean, his continual recovery. And I just pray that you will give him a complete, uh, complete healing. I pray that you'll be with my niece, Tony, as she visits with her oncologist tomorrow, that he will have news for her that will be reassuring and hopefully be on the right track for, um, for her to get started on treatment, if that's what he thinks is right. I pray that you will be with our team, our new team at Wiltshire. They're not new to Wiltshire, but they're new to these jobs and um jobs, I guess, that have been assigned to them now, according to their gifts, and I just pray that you would uh, give them the confidence to move forward and do what they need to do and fill those big shoes of Mark, um, just um, help them to know that they're loved and supported. Lord, I pray that you'll be with Brian, it's just such a horrible, horribly painful thing that he's dealing with, the herniated discs are just very, very painful, and I just pray that his doctor visits you, it will go well, and uh, maybe they can get something for him that will be of comfort and help him to know now what he needs to do to continue to improve and get rid of the pain. I pray that you'll be with Tracy as he deals with possible um, eye surgery or treatment or whatever needs to be done, and I just pray that he'll get the, the word that he needs and the confidence he needs to move forward with that. Pray that you be with Travis and Patty and the loss of their friend. It's just so difficult when it's somebody you care about, that you're close to, or you work with, and we've all had those losses, but you know, it's just so raw right now. I just pray that you'll comfort them. Be with Aaron's family as they fly home tomorrow, that you'll keep them safe. Surround them with a shield of protection that they will be protected from the virus that may be there. And take away their anxiety. You know, just help them to, to realize confidently that you're with them and you'll protect them and you'll keep them safe. Um, I pray that you will calm this virus. Um, you know, we're, we're tired of it. We're, um, we're sad about it. Um, people are depressed about it. People are dying, and I just pray that you will uh, help this to decline so that we see fewer and fewer cases and fewer and fewer deaths, and that this will have an ending soon. We just, we need this to go away, very simply. We just need it to go away. I just pray that you will work on that because we really need you. I just pray that you will be with each of us as we go through this next week. Help us keep in, talk, in uh, contact with each other because we do need each other. Thank you for Dennis's leadership. Uh, thank you for Aaron's um, information today. Just, there's so much to learn in one big chapter and, and uh, just help us to delve into that to learn more and help us be better servants of yours. 
help us to be more kind and loving to others around us and to be good neighbors. Because right now, that's not all we have is neighbors and <clears throat> some have family. So thank you for that. And Lord, I just thank you again for all of our many blessings and the good help that many of us are experiencing. And, and we just pray. And we just pray, pray uh, all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you again, Aaron. And it's great to see everyone. Hope you have a great week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Enjoyed it. Thanks again, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Aaron. <laughs> We just kind of drop out like flies. <laughs> quick, 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 disappearing act. Yes. Wish we could do that to the virus, don't you? Yes. 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 <laughs> that would be great. Safe week, Diana. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. I'll get you, Diana, I'll get you this as soon as I can. I can just go. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a great week.